The Star Wars Battlefront 2 loot box fiasco is no doubt one of the biggest gaming controversies of all time. It's one that has shook the foundations of the games industry, spilling over into mainstream media, and has now caught the attention of several government bodies, which are investigating the predatory nature of loot box based gaming, and could look to agegate the mechanic or outright ban it in several countries. But why did this happen now? There's been loot boxes before, there's been microtransactions before, and there's been pay to win before. So why is it that only now it's been taken seriously by mainstream media and government authorities? To answer this, we need to quickly discuss where microtransactions and DLC have come from, in order to see how we arrived at this point. Over the past 10 years, mobile gaming has normalized microtransaction purchases, so much so that 40% of all gaming revenue in 2017 is estimated to have come from mobile gaming. That's around $42 billion. Additional game purchases in the form of DLC have also become more commonplace, starting off with large expansion packs and eventually shrinking down to smaller, more bite-sized content. This is effectively because the margin of profit increases the smaller the content gets, and a publicly traded company's number one imperative is to increase the margin of profit year on year. Companies have realized that it's far more cost effective to release skin packs, individual models, fake currency, and quick unlock all packs than it is to release a large expansion pack. Both can be profitable, but the smaller content's margin is higher, and the risk is far lower. Furthermore, building an economy into your game ensures multiple purchases over time for virtual currency and rewards. These economies were and are extremely profitable, if the game is good and has an active user base. It's the reason companies now hire economists and engagement designers to figure out and implement systems that will keep people playing and spending over time. When first introduced, one of the issues with these systems from a company's standpoint was that if a user bought everything, they'd have nothing more to spend money on. They bought the skin packs, the weapons and whatever they wanted, or they just bought what they wanted and left the rest on the shelf. So a company could find itself asking, how can we get people to keep spending money in our game, even after they've gotten what they want, without creating more stuff? Simple, just don't give them what they want. Enter the loot box. The loot box is designed to remove the element of choice from your purchasing decision, instead rewarding you with a random item. It could be the item you want, or it could be something you don't want. And in some cases, it can even be something you already have, over and over and over again. This now creates a bottomless pit of spending, with virtually no ceiling. Randomized loot has been around for decades, but tying it to in-game currencies and real-world money is the reason why there has been such a sudden increase in games that feature it. It's a bottomless goldmine. Monetary loot boxes, though they've been around for a long time, have only gone mainstream in the last couple of years. Counter-Strike Global Offensive has a loot box system whereby you earn boxes periodically by playing matches. To open the box and get what's inside, you'll need to purchase virtual keys with real money. The items inside are purely cosmetic, often changing the look of a gun. It doesn't affect anyone else playing the game and it doesn't make you a better player. Items have a rarity to them and items can be traded or sold on the Steam market for real world money. Or you can avoid the randomized boxes altogether and buy the items you want from the Steam market. Overwatch further popularized the mechanic in 2016, rewarding players with regular loot boxes when they level up or with events, that enhanced the cosmetic look of the characters and emotes. It didn't affect gameplay, it wasn't mandatory, and if you received a lot of items, you could convert them into coins to get just what you want. Where Battlefront 2 differs from the previous games mentioned, is that the loot boxes are unavoidable in order to progress through the game. The content isn't additive, it's necessary. So because the whole game was designed around earning credits and loot boxes, which can be purchased for real money, the game's progression was slowed down to a crawl. Most notably, it would take around 40 hours of playtime just to earn Darth Vader, a staple of the Star Wars franchise and character that was in all previous Battlefront games on the onset. This is a design intended to frustrate players to get them to spend money on credits to advance quicker. DICE's community managers would infamously tell you that it's not that, it's instead intended to provide players with a sense of pride and accomplishment for unlocking different heroes. Which, as many of you know, is the most downvoted comment on Reddit, at just under 700,000 downvotes. Further to that, the random loot isn't just your means of progression, but could also give you benefits in-game over other players. Most were small, unobtrusive benefits, but some were complete game changers that would completely upset the balance of the game, giving players massive advantages. A player could earn this same advantage in a stroke of luck, or pay real money repeatedly to earn it eventually. This isn't pay to win in the strictest sense, rather it's pay to progress. Everything in the game is earnable for free, 
However, when the progression is slowed down so dramatically, with some users citing that it would take around 1000 hours to get the best items, the game does become pay to win. So now we have a situation where one of the world's largest publishers, combined with one of the world's largest entertainment IP, is charging above the standard full price of a game and creating a slow-paced economy to encourage purchases of virtual currency to earn random items that will give you an advantage over other players. What were you thinking? Seriously, why was it designed this way? We have it on good authority that EA will sometimes tell their developers to monetize their games with microtransactions and even tell them to change some designs such as adding multiplayer or co-op because it's the new popular thing. It happened to Dead Space and ultimately helped kill the series because of it. Loot boxes are the new hot thing that are clearly generating a lot of revenue. FIFA's ultimate team randomized card system is a massive earner for EA, so it's not unlikely that EA mandated that loot box rewards make their way into Star Wars in some fashion. Did they say it needed to be pay to win? Did they say it needed to cover every aspect of progression? Did they say they wanted it to take 40 hours for mainline heroes to be unlocked? Or did they say they wanted around $2000 of purchasable content? I don't know, and unless someone comes forward and tells us, we won't. Sometimes designers can be incentivized to do this stuff themselves. If you introduce a system that pulls in millions of dollars, you're probably going to get a nice bonus and so is your team. EA are most likely ultimately to blame, as we see microtransactions in pretty much all of their titles, but we see it in many shapes and forms. Having a quick look through the credits of the game, there are four engagement designers at DICE who specialize in monetization and gameplay systems according to their profiles. I'm not on a witch hunt here, but I do believe these people had a heavy hand in the situation we see today. I would love to ask them, would a system like Overwatch's using random cosmetic loot not have been enough? Did Disney the IP holder say you can't change too much aesthetically and rule out the idea of a viable cosmetic economy? What drove you to revolve the entire game's progression around random chances? And did you not test it and think that 40 hours or even 20 hours is just a bit too much to unlock any one thing? Do you find it fun? Do you like to purchase progression? Does it make you feel rewarded? If you didn't like what you were creating or implementing or disagreed with it, did you ever voice your concern to your leads, directors or to EA? Or did you feel like you had to create a system that would generate money without really thinking of the consumer? These are questions we most likely won't get an answer for, for a long time. I'm sure some people will say that EA made them do it, or they had no choice, but I don't think that's the reality. If the decisions were made already on how this was going to be designed, then you don't hire four designers to do it. Or if you do, you don't call them designers, as they haven't designed anything, they're just implementing it. In reality, EA probably set targets for a games-as-a-service system with goals for player retention and player spending that they were looking to achieve. They would then hire and assign engagement designers to come up with a system that works for the game and has the best chance at maximizing profitability. The publisher had announced the removal of the Season Pass and the Map Packs DLC after Battlefront 1's extremely low retention rate fatally divided the player base. Because of this, there was no doubt high pressure to have a very lucrative system to replace the old season pass and DLC packs. Don't get me wrong, EA are definitely to blame for creating an environment where this type of monetization happens, either by rewarding those who implement it, or by mandating specific ways of doing it. But I also believe that the four engagement designers, and perhaps a handful of others at DICE, created an unbelievably bad system that didn't have to be this way. Games often have clever ways of monetizing content that can be fun and rewarding, fit the world and get you to spend more than you'd even like to. This is none of that, and they are not blameless. If my assumptions here are wrong, I would encourage developers to speak to journalists privately about what's happening. It would serve the consumer very well to have this kind of information. So at the beginning of the video I asked, why is it that such tremendous backlash has happened now? It's because of the nature of the implementation of this system. It's incorporated all of the controversial features such as pay to win, loot boxes and microtransactions, on top of an already full price game, and combined it with the largest entertainment IP of all time. It's an unavoidable predatory system, in a massively beloved franchise, a game that's aimed at kids and a company that earns billions. Quite simply, it pushed too far, too fast, jumping ahead of the slow monetization feature creep the industry is being succumbing to. Consumers have been met with similar systems in other games, and its rampant increase in 2017 alone has them saying enough is enough. As Hawaii state officials put it, it's an online casino aimed at children and something needs to be done. EA tried to react, first slashing the progression times by 75% and then eventually turning off microtransactions altogether, albeit temporarily. 
Rumor has it that Disney were getting uncomfortable with the negative press surrounding their IP and told EA to do something about it, and probably quite quickly, which is why we've seen such a dramatic 180 of their system in such a short space of time. What's more, EA said it won't have a material impact on their fiscal year for 2018, but nevertheless investors are losing confidence and their share price is dropping. EA will be fine. In fiscal 2017, they pulled in a net revenue of $3 billion, so I can see why microtransactions in one of their games probably won't have that big of a dent. Now that their game is out, however, it's been met with lofty sales and no way to monetize it. Furthermore, the game's progression is just bad, and players are abusing it by altering their controllers to just endlessly run in circles, earning free currency to unlock things, further ruining the experience for others. Now government legislators are calling for investigations into gambling in games, microtransactions and loot boxes, and are hoping to crack down on the predatory nature of these systems. As mentioned, the mobile games industry relies on kid-friendly games with heavy spending options, so if proper legislation comes in regulating this stuff, it could mean a serious loss of income for companies all over the world. So good job EA, and good job DICE, you pushed it too far, and now everyone's watching and everyone's talking about what you and some other scummy companies have been getting away with. Is it likely that anything will really change though? Probably not. The definition of gambling and incentivized spending is so muddled right now that I think companies would just find another way around it. Unless somehow a law was passed saying a purchase must be upfront about what you receive and has no element of chance, then I don't see things changing. But companies will be more hesitant for the time being. You wouldn't want to introduce loot boxes in your 2018 games as a service only for it to be banned in 2019. Plus, everyone would hate you. So, it's a victory for gamers who want quality entertainment products and not slot machine style gambling. To those who say AAA development is too expensive without microtransactions or DLC, you're wrong. The answer is it's very cheap to make extra content and it makes a lot of money. They simply want to create as high a margin as possible and earn more year on year. That's always the goal. It's extremely unpredictable how additive content will do because it relies on so many factors. The reception of the game, the retention over time, the quality of the content, and much more. So companies never base their profitability off of something so unpredictable. It's always just extra cash on top. So that's it for my take on the Star Wars Battlefront 2 controversy. This issue is ongoing and is the reason I took so long to get to it. Every other day some story popped up changing the landscape and I didn't want to rush a video out and have to update it later. It'll be very interesting to see what EA and DICE do in the coming months to re-monetize their game, and if you enjoyed this video and it gets a good response, then I'll make sure to keep covering it as it develops. I don't own Battlefront 2 and personally have no intention of buying games that treat their players as users they can monetize. There's too many good games out there that don't do that, so I'll stick to them. Thank you very much for watching and please consider leaving a like on the video if you enjoyed it, and share it wherever you can if you think it has a good message. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.